I, I'm excited about the work uh, that I'm going to share with you here. And uh, a lot of it's new. A lot of it um, I, I've tried to just capture with some imagery to kind of uh, be, be easy on, uh, on your brain today. And I, I'll point to some other uh, some papers and other things that you may want to take a look at um, after this uh, for additional details. So this is a pretty high level uh, presentation. Um, and my interest, is, as Brittany mentioned, is in microbiology and particularly the dispersal of microorganisms in the atmosphere. And that can be uh, the atmosphere uh, in open air or it can be in uh, built environments like the space station. But for this presentation, we're going to talk about um, dispersal in the open atmosphere. And at the bottom of this intro slide, you can see how to contact me and a couple of our websites for additional information. Please go take a look at those if you're interested in aerobiology. I'll start with maybe six or so minutes of basic information about dispersal of microorganisms to provide some context. And then what I'm going to try and do through the work in my lab at NASA Ames is make the connections to astrobiology. And I'll do that in two ways. Uh, first, through high altitude aircraft sampling campaigns that we're doing in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and with uh, those results, I'll try and make the connection to life detection missions, uh, particularly how we sample uh, trace signatures of life in low biomass environments. And then the last part of my presentation, I'm going to talk about some of our work on high altitude scientific balloons, where we are exposing microorganisms to that environment in a way that's analogous to the conditions that forward contaminants, microbes inadvertently delivered to planets like Mars, uh, the, the same sorts of conditions that uh, those contaminants may be experiencing, we can reproduce using high altitude scientific balloons. So that's where we're going today. And those are the linkages between the field of aerobiology and, and astrobiology. So I mentioned I'm in California, uh, even though I'm, I'm uh, on detailed NASA headquarters, my, my home center is out here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, please come visit if uh, and when we get back to normal. And uh, if you're ever in the Bay Area, Ames is an incredible campus. Um, I think most of you probably know the kinds of work that's going on here, particularly in the fields of astrobiology and space biology. And um, it's really unlike other NASA centers in a lot of ways. And I'd love to, to host you and show you around or, or ask Jordan McCaig. I know Jordan's in the room. She's spent some time at NASA Ames. Uh, right before COVID hit, we cut the ribbon on this brand new biosciences facility in the heart of the NASA Ames campus. So it, it's, it's a pretty spectacular facility, state of the art, and it's under one roof, uh, got interdisciplinary biologists and engineers. So it's just a very exciting time to be at NASA Ames, um, particularly as NASA's on the cusp of um, doing the kinds of science I think everybody in this seminar is interested in, uh, looking for signs of life in the universe and figuring out the engineering solutions for that. Th those are the sorts of things that we're um, working on in this new biosciences collaborative facility. Okay, so let me actually transition to aerobiology and, and the heart of the matter here uh, for the seminar. I used to have to spend a lot more time on this overview uh, than I do now during the COVID era. I, I feel like the public at large is too familiar with the notion of microorganisms and dispersal in the environment, sadly, due to what's going on right now with the global pandemic. So I won't harp on that other than saying microorganisms um, of variety viruses, fungi, bacteria, spores, pollen, all of that biomass on planet Earth can get swept up into the atmosphere. And depending on how big that biomass is, um, it, can, uh, it can travel huge distances, um, eventually settling through dry or wet precipitation. But what this overview uh, is hopefully painting is that there's um, a variety of uh, biomass that can get dispersed in the atmosphere. And a lot of that biomass or fragments of that biomass is the same size as other aerosols that we may be more familiar with because, you know, we can see them. So, for instance, you know, wildfire smoke or, or, or soot or dust, um, smog, all the things that you're kind of familiar with in terms of aerosols. Uh, 
Um, I think we're increasingly start, starting to think about the co-transported biological aerosols in um, those other um, aerosol uh, populations or species, if you will. So that, that's, that's the point of this slide, is to sort of make those linkages uh, for you, to say that um, basically, you know, where other aerosols travel, so do the biological aerosols. So this graphic, uh, I think, is, is kind of cute, but it also uh, points to the main sources and sinks and pathways, if you will, uh, in the field of aerobiology today. And, you know, as you can see from this overview, it's complicated, but um, we've got people interested in, um, uh, you know, the boundary layer aerobiology, meaning the, the microbes that are traveling near the Earth's surface and the various places that they get swept up from, whether it's, you know, an agricultural setting or a city, wastewater treatment facility, uh, or even marine environments. And then we've got folks that are interested in measuring, including my group, and what happens when some of those biological aerosols reach higher altitudes? How far can they travel? We've got others interested, particularly some groups in France led by Pierre Amato that are looking at what happens when the biological aerosols go into clouds. Is there any metabolic activity happening in a wet environment, albeit an ultra cold one and one that is temporary, meaning clouds aren't permanent and eventually what's in clouds falls out. But those are those sorts of questions happening in aerobiology. And so uh, it's a very interdisciplinary field and there's so many questions right now. Um, and I think one of the main points I'll make in my talk today is in order to study any of this, we need to have better systems for making collections. So I'm going to get to that in a second. But I, I promised I would point you to some other resources in case you want to know more about what's going on in the larger field of aerobiology. And this book came out a couple of years ago. It's a collection of review articles that I think is pretty comprehensive. And so go ahead and take a look at that uh, book if, if what I'm saying today strikes your interest and you want to know more. All right, so I mentioned this idea that biology uh, is co-transported on other aerosols. And what we spend a lot of time focusing on uh, is the co-transportation with dust. So I'm showing, and I hope the video is playing okay, this incredible visualization from NASA Goddard, which is showing basically an atmospheric bridge, dust traveling across oceans. Um, and so uh, it's rather intuitive uh, when we realize that dust is traveling around the planet to assert that microorganisms are traveling around the planet too on these upper atmospheric winds. On the right, I'm just showing you a beautiful micrograph from my lab, which is um, hopefully conveying the relative size of bacterial spores as pictured, those little raisin-like structures attached to a, a dust particle, and you can see the scale bar there. Just to convey again, um, a lot of biology is sticky, and a lot of biology, particularly in the topsoil uh, that dries out in arid environments, uh, uh, globs on to uh, forget. <laughs> <laughs> forgive the expression, two dust particles. Uh, just another uh, awesome image here. Uh, you, got, you, you remember last summer, the Saharan superplume? You probably heard about it living in Georgia. Um, so, you know, uh, th 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 this phenomenon of uh, trans-Pacific, trans-Atlantic dust plumes is well documented. What's less documented is um, the uh, microorganisms that are sort of riding along those blooms. And again, just a couple awesome micrographs from our lab showing. Um, the point I'm trying to make here is that long range transport aerobiology is occurring at scales that are really hard to wrestle with, right? On the one hand, you've got microorganisms that are micrometers in size. On the other hand, you've got those same um, cells traveling kilometers. So it is it is a really hard uh, discipline to make measurements. Uh, and it ha given the scale of the global dispersal, it has to be done in a coordinated international manner. Um, and I would say we're just starting to figure out how to do that, but we have a long way to go. Um, the measurements that have been occurring around the world uh, often occur at, you know, Alpine observatories, a handful of aircraft flights. Um, and, you know, we can take a stab at 
based on you know the sparse measurements we have made of bioaerosols in the atmosphere, the 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 the, the global extent of the emissions. These numbers are really rough, but based on the handful of measurements that have been made, we can uh, estimate that anywhere between five to fifty percent of aerosols greater than two microns in Earth's atmosphere are biological in nature, and that is just a stunning realization. So I like to show uh, pig pen from peanuts on this chart just to sort of make the point that um, our planet's atmosphere is loaded with microorganism. Um, okay, so now I actually want to get to my work. So all of that set uh, up my motivation for uh, my my uh, campaigns, if you will, at the University of Washington. And I mentioned that Alpine observatories can be used as a, a place to sort of sniff upper atmospheric air around the clock. Um, and we did that. And so uh, I showed you the Saharan superplume crossing the Atlantic Ocean. But in the, the case of my work, University of Washington, we were in the springtime measuring um, trans-Pacific dust plumes that were reaching this mountaintop. And basically, um, that's what you can see at the bottom of this, uh, this, this, this slide. We were just sniffing the air until two very distinct dust load and plumes arrived at the observatory, and we captured the microorganisms during those events. And we basically looked at what showed up that wasn't in the air before uh, those dust plumes arrived, and that's what's depicted on the bottom right there. And we tried to pay attention to microbial taxa that really seemed to not be local in the sense like the 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 ones depicted on on the bottom of this chart, um, microorganisms that are associated with marine environments, microorganisms that are associated with dried lake beds, so on and so forth. That really had no business being where we were sampling the air uh, in central Oregon on top of the mountain. But as I got to NASA, I wanted to be able to do this as the air masses were traveling. And so uh, we spent some time figuring out how to do that uh, using NASA aircraft. And uh, around the time we published our, our work from um, that Alpine Observatory in Central Oregon, a group out of Georgia Tech was doing some sampling on the NASA DC-8, which is another um, highly used uh, platform for Earth science campaigns. Um, and while that, that asset was useful, I wanted to have the ability to, let's say, fly higher and um, more robustly clean uh, our system for bringing air into the vehicle, basically starting with a pristine system. So that's going to go back to the point I made earlier about sampling biomass uh, and doing so in a reliable way in an in a environment where the biomass is in really low concentration. And so um, circled on this uh, photo above my team is basically a window plate on the C-20A aircraft loaned by NASA Armstrong um, that we we popped out and modified so that we could bring air into this vehicle on uh, flights lasting for about six hours up to 40,000 feet, and we could sterilize the system in between um, sampling events. So this is what it looks like on the inside of the airplane, and I'm going to show you some of the data in a minute, but uh, we can basically turn the flow on and off uh, on demand wherever we're flying. Um, as I mentioned before, we can pop out the sampling system and uh, inlet lines in between flights. We can measure the flow so that we can derive what the concentrations uh, of biomass uh, we're sampling are based on how much air is coming into the vehicle. And just to give you a sense of like how we fly missions, and we started these flights back in, I'd say, 2016. Um, what we'll do is, at least in the, on the first campaign, to just see if the system was working, we'll uh, take samples on our way up uh, and basically add our cruising altitude. So at the top left, you can see San Francisco, actually. I know that it's a little bit grainy, but that's San Francisco below. Um, we're flying at about 40,000 feet, sniffing the air. And on the bottom, I'm showing all these other samples that we took to try and ascertain the known system contamination, um, you know, we can't autoclave the aircraft, right? We can do our best, though, to establish a baseline of contaminants associated with the system. And so those those red X's are showing you where we swabbed before and after we flew. Um, and what we'll show you here in a minute is, uh, you know, the signal to noise, if you will. So 
what microbes in the atmosphere did we um, identify that we did not identify on our system? So that, that's the kind of connection I want to make to astrobiology is um, with our spacecraft traveling to Mars and elsewhere, we, we try and clean them, uh, but we know they're not pristine. And therefore, when we're looking for signs of life, how do we make sure that if we detect life, native life on, a, on, a, on a, another world, that it's not what we brought on our, on our vehicle? Um, and it's not easy to do. Uh, so here are some results. Um, I'll just say, you know, without going into like all the microbiology and how we do these analyses, because I don't, I don't think most of you want to hear about like all of the um, species that we collected. Maybe you do. But um, our DNA methods are really, really sensitive and getting better all the time. And so um, because of that sensitivity, though, we're also really capable of detecting the contamination in our system. And so, you know, in, in our paper here, we just we just try and be really transparent about the contaminants that we detect. So uh, on a figure like the one shown on the right, what we're showing is basically on the left side of that dotted line, microbes that we sniffed in the atmosphere that were enriched compared to uh, ground samples or samples from the aircraft itself, meaning either they showed up in, in, the, in the atmospheric samples and didn't show up on any of our controls or they showed up in a way that was significantly above. So, you know, I don't know if that's a perfect approach and I don't know if the approach we use in um, various missions that are uh, astrobiologically oriented, but it, it is it is a way of at least acknowledging a system uh, level contamination. So that, I'm gonna just pause there before I show you some more results from our aircraft studies with just, just driving home the same point. Um, you know, it, it's it, it's summarized in this in this little essay I wrote, and I'm calling out uh, again just to make the connections explicit. As as we travel and look for signs of life elsewhere, we need to acknowledge that um, we we must be careful about the contamination signal. Um, after I, I sh I'm finished showing you some of the aircraft results, I'm going to um, approach this conundrum from another way, which is uh, with the the balloon studies and the results I'm going to show you there. Um, the connection I'll make is basically, can we measure the um, the fate of the contaminants using high altitude balloons? So bear with me in about 10 minutes, I'm gonna circle back to this conundrum. Okay, I wanna finish though with um, what we've done more recently with these aircraft flights on the C-20A. With our first um, set of results, we were really just trying to verify that the system was collecting, collecting uh, somewhat reliable. With our follow-on mission, and by the way, ABC stands for Aircraft uh, Bioaerosol Collector, a nice cute acronym. Uh, with our second campaign, we flew over the Sierra Nevada mountain range in California, which is what you see on the photo there. Um, and we wanted to actually get better resolution on what was happening as we got higher above the surface. And so we did uh, a staircase pattern on these flights in 10,000 foot increments up to 40,000 feet to see how the microbial taxa were potentially shifting as we got a higher above the Earth's surface. So there's a lot to unpack on this on this slide, and I'll just say to orient you quickly, um, again, we're trying to be transparent about the, the system level signal that we see, which is the ground controls depicted on the far left. I, I should say that we're reporting two days worth of flights here. Um, so on the top and on the bottom, those are two consecutive days in June 2018 that we flew. And as you move from left to right on this chart, um, we're increasing in height above the Earth's surface, so 10,000 to 40,000 feet. Um, and then we're reporting basically uh, measurements from two different stages within our sampling system. And we're making comparisons, that's what the colored dots are, between the signal in the atmosphere and the signal in the aircraft and on the outside of the aircraft. So, you know, I'm not gonna drill into this. Um, and again, I'm not gonna pull out the significant differences, but uh, uh, going back to sort of this, this, this theme of life detection and signal to noise, this is just how we're, we're wrestling with that, um, that challenge here. Um, and I'll, I'll just show you again, this is, this is an eye chart, I apologize, which is why I'm showing you this beautiful um, bacterial spore on the right. Because I, I get frustrated when uh, microbiologists just show, um, you know, 
a bunch of different colors indicating a bunch of different, in this case, genera, like what does this mean? Um, <laughs> I, so I like to show um, micrographs of, of microbes to remind us that like uh, they're real. They're, they're not just colored bars on a chart or um, you know genus names that we can't pronounce. Uh, but what I'm, what I'm summarizing here on the left is, is uh, again, two different uh, missions, consecutive days flown above the Sierra Nevada. And again, as you move at the bottom from left to right, uh, we're getting higher above the surface. And I think you can see, um, even if you're not a microbiologist, that um, the relative abundance or the proportion of microbes that we're measuring are changing with height above the surface, and they're changing day to day. So my takeaway from our results here is that the uh, atmospheric microbiology is really dynamic, um, and I'll just leave it at that. Okay, so I want to shift now uh, to our high altitude scientific balloon studies. And I want to do that um, linking back to, the, okay, hopefully by now I've convinced you that there are microorganisms at high altitudes. Um, what I didn't report to you, but we do report in our, our work, and others have done this as well, is that there is a subset of microbiology um, that's actually viable, recoverable from the upper atmosphere. Um, even though most of the data I just showed you are based on DNA measurements alone, um, you know, classic microbiological methods are to try and recover um, living organisms from samples. We know we don't do that well. And in the atmosphere where these cells are getting shocked, you know, most are getting killed, at least, well, I'm going to show you that in a minute. Um, we think most are getting killed, but we, nevertheless, we can recover some of that biomass and, and uh, bring it back to life, which is remarkable. And I want to, I want to, um, I want to say it's remarkable if you look at this chart because of the environmental condition. Um, and the, the fact that we've got microbiology passing through our upper atmosphere and surviving is important for reasons that should be self-evident in this, in the middle part of this chart. Uh, an ultra cold, thin air, dry, irradiated environment is a lot like Mars. Um, and so that's why I'm showing you that, uh, in the middle of this chart. And one of my, one of my fantastic students, uh, in the lab at Ames was able to send, uh, a UV radiometer up into the stratosphere and the, the, uh, results reported in blue are what, um, he was able to measure. And I want to compare those to the ultraviolet radiation levels on Mars in red. And I, I just want you to see the agreement there. Um, once we get above the Earth's ozone layer, um, that intense biocidal ultraviolet light is um, what you would expect also on Mars. And that's, that is really one of the most limiting factors for any microbiology that we inadvertently carry to Mars on our rovers. It's that uh, low wavelength ultraviolet radiation. And so um, that, that's why I want to set the stage uh, in, 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 for, for why we're doing the, the balloon uh, work in our lab is because we can essentially get to Mars by just traveling above our ozone layer. So in order to do that, we had to build a couple containers uh, that could not only carry microorganisms to that environment uh, in a way that was controlled, but also make some of the, the measurements of the environmental conditions. So I would want to show you results from two of the systems that my group has uh, built and tested and flown in recent years. One is called EMIST, and the other is called MarsBox. Um, and uh, EMIST is, is the, the system that's flown now like four times, I want to say. Uh, MarsBox is a little bit newer. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some pretty pictures and videos. This is what it looks like, at least for EMIST, when we fly. Um, you can see we've got microorganisms that we basically deposit on those little metallic coupons. And then once we get to the stratosphere above the ozone layer, uh, we have the system activate such that the microbes that we deposit can then be exposed to those conditions. And then, um, and you can see in the central panel how we measure the environmental conditions. Um, and you can see our radiometers. Um, on our first series of flights, we took a, a, a bacterial endospore. Um, one that's known to be in spacecraft assembly facility rooms, and we deposited a known quantity on those um, sample uh, coupons, those metallic coupons. And we basically had, we had a really simple experiment. We would um, uh, 
have a subset that were exposed directly to sunlight, including the ultraviolet radiation, and some that were not, meaning inverted or sort of representative of uh, bacteria on spacecraft that would be shaded from sunlight or buried within the spacecraft interior. So those samples, the ones that were exposed to all atmospheric conditions except for sunlight are the black uh, dots on this chart. And the ones that were exposed to sunlight, including the ultraviolet radiation, are in red. And I, I mean, you can see what happens. So basically biomass contamination that is on um, in a Moore's-like environment, but protected from sunlight does just fine, at least with the endospores that we were studying, whereas ones that get um, lit up die pretty fast. <laughs> That's our takeaway here. Uh, but again, this was just one species that we tested, and it was only for about eight hours on this first flight. Um, if you want to read more about that system, we have a 2017 astrobiology paper. But we realized that we needed to test other types of microbes, like how representative um, was the first data set. And so we built this second system and we um, flew in 2019. This system is Mars Box and it's a little bit different. Rather than exposing the samples directly to the atmosphere, what this system does in the central portion of, of the payload, you can see um, that there's actually glass covering the samples. And so what we did is we filled the samples, sample container with a Mars gas mix. Now hopefully make this, um, even more Mars-like of an experiment. So now we've got mostly CO2 at um, about seven millibars inside that glass container, and the glass is allowing all the ultraviolet radiation to pass through. Um, and on our flight uh, in 2019, we flew four different microorganisms. Um, these are the ones that we tested, including um, Aspergillus, and we just reported the results. In a second, I'll show you uh, where to find those results, but um, our first flight was over New Mexico, and hopefully these videos are playing. You can see on the bottom right, after we launch and we get um, to about 70,000 feet, the experiment starts. This flight only lasted six hours, then came down. And on the upper left, you'll be able to see it coming down. And again, we closed the system on the way down. You'll see the little shutter closing. I hope you can see our, our fun mascots on this balloon too, on the right, the penguin and the frog which um, you should definitely put fun little things in your science, especially once you get um, some news headlines so that people latch onto that. And <laughs> instead of asking you why you're sending microorganisms above their head, um, <laughs> just, yes, that, that, that's a little advice for, for future studies, folks. Put, put fun stuffed animals in all of your science photos. Um, this is the new paper. And, um, what was really surprising in, in this data set, um, I mentioned the, the four microbes that we flew on this study, um, including Aspergillus. The fungus, which is pigmented, and this is a fungus that you can find everywhere. You know, you can uh, find out outside uh, in the soil, you can probably find, but hopefully not in high concentration in your house. Um, the fungus did really well um, in terms of it, uh, withstanding the environmental conditions in the middle stratosphere. And so that was a surprising result because most planetary protection research to date is focused on the endurance of bacteria and not fungus. Okay, Brittany, I put this one in there for you. So um, we have flown and, and most of the data I just showed you is from um, over the United States launching balloons from New Mexico. The problem with doing that, well, I shouldn't say problem. The limit of doing that is that those flights are short lived usually only up to about eight hours. And so what we really want to understand is if we if we send uh, microbes into the, 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 ap the atmosphere uh, for longer periods of time, not hours, but days or even weeks, what's going to happen? Um, because as, as we showed you, at least with the Aspergillus data and even with the Bacillus data, we do have a little bit of survivorship um, and we don't know if that survivorship is going to trail off. Uh, with longer duration exposures. So that's why we have been flying out of Antarctica. Um, what's really unique about Antarctic balloon missions is that uh, during uh, the Antarctic summer, they can, if launched in around uh, early December, these balloon missions can basically do laps around the polar stratosphere and um, they can uh, be aloft for many weeks. Um, and, and that's because since the sun isn't setting, um, they can continually power the payloads and um, they can 
in theory, drop the entire system close to where it's launched, uh, just outside of McMurdo Station, Antarctica. Um, so there's lots of unique reasons to fly from Antarctica. And um, my good friend Brittany uh, blessed our payload prior to one of the launches. We we just send our payload down to the ice. We don't travel with it, which is kind of awesome. This was our first launch attempt in um, 2017. It was short-lived. Um, there was a leak on the balloon system, unfortunately, so we didn't um, get a long exposure, but you can see like a pretty awesome uh, shot, at least, uh, for the short-lived mission with the ice below. And we flew again, thankfully, the following year. Um, we launched in uh, 2018, and it was a 32-day mission. Um, I'm going to show you on the upper right uh, basically what the the float path looked like. We did two full laps around Antarctica. I don't have the microbiology data to report yet. We got the samples back right before COVID, and they're still sitting in the lab. But I do have some radiation data to report, which I'm excited about. In fact, that's what the color um, indicates on the panel, the video on the upper right. It's the... Um, ionizing dose rate that we're measuring in a tiny little um, uh, uh, active dosimeter that sits under the um, panel of our payload. That red box indicates where this dosimeter sits. Um, it's silicon-based detection uh, developed by our good friends over in Germany at the um, DLR who have been flying this active dosimeter elsewhere. Um, and uh, this is, you know, I've been, I've been emphasizing a lot the biocidal effects of ultraviolet radiation on um, contaminants that we, we either put in our atmosphere or contaminants that we're worried about sending to other planets. Um, we, we also need to know the ionizing radiation levels because those can be deadly to cells as well, too. And it, they're particularly important um, at the poles based on um, the way that Earth's magnetosphere um, funnels energetic particles uh, uh, from space um, into Earth's atmosphere at that location. Um, and I'm just going to finish by by uh, presenting something that is um, currently posted but in review. Um, and, it, and it's a really exciting data set. Again, I'm a microbiologist. I don't do radiation biology. But we, with these measurements from that tiny active dosimeter, we're able to ascertain that the ionizing radiation dose at the poles, and that's presented in the green bar at the very bottom, uh, at about 200 micrograys per day is really close. The ionizing radiation uh, levels we expect on the surface of Mars, which is at the top uh, of the panel in red. So the reason I'm showing you this is to uh, make the case that Mars is not that far away. Um, for folks that are interested in testing instruments or seeing how biology responds to Mars surface-like conditions, we are arguing in this paper that that can be done on a uh, long duration polar balloon mission, which is kind of awesome, I think. Okay, that's it. Um, I think I'm doing all right on time, so I'll just summarize what I've presented and then we'll um, take questions. So uh, I hopefully painted the picture that microbes are getting dispersed naturally in Earth's atmosphere. I talked about how we're making those collections um, with NASA aircraft, um, and we, we obviously have a lot of work left to do to make sense of the measurements. But um, we're starting to present a method for um, ascertaining which uh, signal is real in the atmosphere versus which signal just comes from our, our sampling system. Um, I'm eager to hear your impressions or if you get a chance to read our papers to see whether or not you agree with, um, with that approach. And then um, I finished by uh, drawing connections to uh, our balloon experiments and um, hopefully making the case that we can use the middle stratosphere above the ozone layer in particular to mimic Martian conditions and get a handle on the outcomes for any microbial contaminants that we're carrying with us on spacecraft to Mars in particular, um, that it's a useful analog environment um, here on Earth, above our Earth's surface anyway, for planetary protection questions. Okay, so I didn't do all this by myself. Um, I wish I could squeeze more pictures onto this chart because there have been so many amazing people and collaborators and teammates and students who have contributed to the data that you saw there. So um, this is not everyone, but um, this is the best part of being at NASA or doing science in general, not even at NASA, is 
having all these fabulous people and working on things together that you're excited about. So I'll finish by um, just acknowledging how how we funded some of the stuff that we've been doing. Um, and uh, I want to stop there and take questions. And I'll probably stop sharing the screen so I can actually see you. Thanks for listening.